good evening to those of you joining this uh, new edition of the Human Rights Conversation series from uh, wherever you may be. My name is uh, Domenico Zipoli. I'm a research fellow and project coordinator at the Geneva Human Rights Platform, and I'll be uh, your moderator for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Today's event on UN human rights mechanisms and mega sporting events, the road to FIFA 2022 and 2023, is part of a, a series of conversations hosted by the Geneva Human Rights Platform aimed at discussing contemporary issues and challenges related to the promotion and protection of human rights, both here in Geneva and uh, beyond. Uh, these conversations represent uh, an opportunity to zoom in on uh, uh, some of the most interesting updates from Geneva-based uh, human rights uh, mechanisms, whilst at the same time connecting these to relevant action by human rights stakeholders at both regional and national levels. The topic of today is particularly interesting and complex, I find, um, as it not only connects the international and national levels of human rights promotion and protection. It also brings to the fore the many correlations between the world of sport, uh, the world of business and uh, human rights, especially in the context of the uh, delivery and ultimately the legacy of uh, mega sporting events. We will be tackling this interconnection by focusing on how UN human rights mechanisms, as well as national human rights actors, have addressed the human rights implications of two of the most anticipated mega sporting events that will be taking place in the, in the upcoming months, the FIFA Men's World Cup 2022 hosted by Qatar and the FIFA, World's, the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 jointly hosted by Australia and um, New Zealand. Today's discussion uh, wishes to highlight outcomes and challenges of human rights monitoring in this uh, context and offer reflections on what can be improved towards uh, fully responsible mega sporting events. Four distinguished guests accompany me in our conversation today, and I will briefly introduce them um, to you now before running through the structure of the event. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to introduce to you um, our first guest, uh, Mary Harvey, Chief Executive of the Center for Sport and Human Rights. Thank you, Mary, for being with us today. And uh, thank you also to our dear colleagues from the Center for Sport and Human Rights, Guido Battaglia, William Rook, for facilitating your participation um, and for providing us with, with precious uh, updates from the world of sport and human rights in the buildup to this event. Our second guest, François Crepeau, Hans and Tamar Oppenheimer Chair in Public International Law at the Faculty of Law at McGill University and a former UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants. Thank you, François, for joining from Canada this early in the morning. Um, our third guest today, Vazilka Sanchin, Director of the Institute for International Law and International Relations at the University of Ljubljana and member as well as Vice Chair of the UN Human Rights Committee. Welcome, Bajuka. And um, our fourth guest, Justin Nolan, professor at the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales, uh, Sydney, and director of the Australian Human Rights uh, Institute. Justine, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, at this uh, late, uh, late hour in Sydney. Unfortunately, Najwa Altani from the Supreme Committee on uh, Delivery and Legacy of Qatar 2022 could not make it today uh, due to a last minute uh, underlabel uh, um, commitment. So these are the guests of today. Just a few, few words on the structure of the, the event we'll observe. Um, I will soon uh, give the floor to Mary Harvey for some introductory remarks on behalf of the uh, Center for Sport and, and, and Human Rights in order to set the scene uh, for the debate. Um, our three distinguished speakers will then give their presentations back to back for approximately six, seven minutes each, which will then leave us ample time for uh, questions and answers uh, with uh, you, with the audience uh, until the end of, 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 the, of the event. As a very last introductory point from my side, um, I would like to thank the many of you who've uh, registered to this uh, event. And for those of you who could not join uh, at this specific time, the meeting is being recorded and will be then broadcast on our website in the coming um, days. 
So that's it for me. Let us now turn to our first guest uh, this, this afternoon. Uh, before joining the Center for Sport and Human Rights, uh, Mary Harvey has served numerous uh, organizations in the fields of sports governance and sustainability, including, uh, including FIFA. Uh, in 2017, Mary joined the bid, to, uh, the bid team uh, to bring the 2026 FIFA World Cup to North America and was responsible for writing the um, historic uh, United 2026 Human Rights uh, Strategy, the first of its kind for a mega sporting uh, event. As we all know, the 2026 FIFA World Cup was indeed awarded to Canada, Mexico, and the United States. So congratulations, Mary, on, on, on that. And um, as a last um, but very crucial point of uh, Mary's career, Mary also enjoyed an extraordinary career with the US women's national soccer team, uh, winning the inaugural FIFA uh, Women's World Cup in 1991 and the Olympic gold in 1996. With this introduction, Mary, over, over to you. Thanks, uh, Domenico, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the Human Rights Conversations of the Geneva Academy for organizing this event. Um, this is an important event, connecting the work of human rights mechanisms to challenges involving the organization of mega sporting events. And all of us here today have some connection or some interest to mega sporting events. So as mentioned, I'm Mary Harvey. I'm the Chief Executive of the Center for Sport and Human Rights. And has been mentioned, um, I come to this from the world of sport. So um, I was an athlete uh, for a number of years in the sport I love, football, um, and uh, held a variety of positions in sports governance and sports administration uh, before I became a member of the bid team, as, as was mentioned, um, for the 2026 World Cup. And uh, I'll never forget um, when I joined the bid team, uh, I thought I was going to work on environmental protection. And they said, no, we need someone to head up the human rights strategy part because it's new and nobody knows it. And I said, well, I don't know it. And they said, you're gonna learn. <laughs> so that's what I did. And I'd love to share some of that with you. Um, so my brief intervention today will highlight three points. First, the importance of mega sporting events as catalysts for human rights actions and reforms, both for host countries and for tournament organizers. Second, we'll look at the various actors who have a role in ensuring sporting events respect internationally recognized human rights. And third, the need for ongoing engagement and dialogue between human rights mechanisms, UN human rights mechanisms, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, host countries and tournament organizers. I can't state enough how critical this engagement is. And then I'll conclude with a few examples of our work at the center, including our own efforts to cooperate with a range of actors in the UN human rights system and helping to ensure that those responsible for and involved in the delivery of mega sporting events live up to their duties and responsibilities. So first, let's talk about the role of mega sporting events as catalysts for change. I think we'd all agree that mega sporting events or major sporting events like the Olympic Games and the FIFA World Cup can enhance freedoms and celebrate human dignity. They have potential to advance human rights through a variety of ways, job creation, employability, new social housing, urban regeneration, so on and so forth. If organized responsibly, an event's legacy can deliver lasting impacts to the host community, improve infrastructure, promote sports participation and healthy lifestyles. However, for these events to have authentic social legacy, they must start from a place of causing zero harms to those engaged in making these events happen. To do this, it means addressing and mitigating human rights risks linked to the organization of these events at every stage of their development and delivery. Because the unfortunate reality is, with very few exceptions, major sporting events have been associated with violations of human rights. This includes forced evictions, violations of workers' rights, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that later, in particular those of migrant workers, 
and the suppression of freedom of speech and the right to protest among, among few. So now let's look at the role and responsibilities of all sports actors in respecting internationally recognized human rights. So who's involved? Well, the answer is, is that many actors are involved, including national governments, state, municipal, and local authorities, sports governing bodies, local organizing committees, international federations, national sports bodies, but also the private sector, worker representative, union representatives, and civil society. So all are involved in ensuring that these events are delivered responsibly. Indeed, what we talk at the center is the idea of an ecosystem. So to ensure human rights are respected and upheld, the roles and responsibilities of each of these actors should be well-defined and communicated from the outset. And areas of overlapping responsibility clearly mapped and understood. So for this reason, starting this work at the bidding phase, it should be clear that hosts should consider what human rights risks they're likely to encounter throughout the life cycle. And I can't emphasize enough the role of engagement in doing that. Relevant stakeholders ought to be at the center of any event concept and planning, again, to uncover what the risks are. And those wishing to host a mega sporting event should make human rights including worker rights, a central part of their bid and event plan. In recent years, organizations like FIFA, the Commonwealth Games Federations, and others have included human rights elements in their bidding requirements. The 2026 World Cup, which has been mentioned, is one of the first mega sporting events to include extensive requirements, which did not exist, for example, when the World Cup was awarded to Qatar 10 years ago. So the inclusion of human rights requirements in the bidding phase is a fundamental precondition for host states to use their leverage and influence to ensure that human rights are respected at every stage, including through impact assessments, ongoing due diligence, remediation, which is oftentimes the hardest part, transparency, and critically, stakeholder engagement. So third, I'd like to say a few words on the need for ongoing engagement and dialogue between UN human rights mechanisms, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, host countries, and tournament organizers. So dialogue and communications between the representatives of the sports human rights world and actors in sport is essential. The special procedures of the Human Rights Council and the wider UN system are in a unique position to provide knowledge, insights, tools, and tools to further promote and protect human rights for all mega sporting event stakeholders. So we've been see, pleased to see that specific mandates are increasingly engaging on how the world of sport can have adverse impacts on people's rights and highlighting how reforms could be achieved. The ILO, for example, has been also actively engaged in addressing labor rights issues in the world of sport and held in 2020 uh, a major event looking at uh, working conditions within the world of sport. So we at the center are fortunate to have OHCHR, the ILO, UNICEF, UNHCR, and UNESCO involved in different aspects of our work as a convener, as a, uh, in our work as a convener of collective dialogue and action, supporting actors to raise awareness of human rights risks within sport, build capacity to prevent and mitigate harms and maximize positive impact and lasting value. So a recent example of our work, which is relevant to this discussion today, is a newly released report that provides an independent perspective on the human rights plans of each of the cities competing to host the 2026 FIFA Men's World Cup matches. And uh, perhaps one of my colleagues might uh, paste a link to that report in the chat. The report is titled, The Promise of a Positive Legacy. The 2026 FIFA World Cup host city candidates human rights plans. It provides an overview of the diverse and wide-ranging plans published by each of the cities 
who want to become a host of the World Cup to address the human rights impacts of hosting the international event. And that covers 22 cities across the North American continent. The UN mechanism's involvement in this process over the coming years in advising and monitoring progress would indeed be a welcome contribution. So a little bit of a challenge there. So I'd like to thank uh, all of you for your attention. And I'm looking forward, like all of you, to listening to the experts that will be taking the floor and the discussions that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for this uh, uh, beautiful introduction and for especially for unpacking uh, for us this, this uh, complex ecosystem that revolves around uh, the delivery, but as well, of course, the, the follow up, the legacy to, to mega, mega sporting events, and as well as the responsibilities and roles that each actor within this, this ecosystem um, plays. Perhaps later on, we, we can return to, to, um, to a discussion on, on, on those human rights requirements in the bidding phase of that this novel uh, policy that, uh, that sees uh, the FIFA World Cup 2026 as a, as a promising uh, first and, and best practice. Um, let us now turn to our uh, panelists. And um, with this, I'm, I'm delighted to, um, to give the floor to uh, Francois uh, Cripeau, as said, uh, a public, uh, professor of public international law at the Faculty of um, Law at McGill University and uh, UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants from 2011 to 2017. And uh, during his mandate, Francois conducted several uh, official visits and relevant to our discussion today, uh, conducted a visit to Qatar in 2013. And that is three years after Qatar won the bid to host the 2022 uh, World Cup. Uh, during uh, his eight a uh, day mission to the country, Francois met with a range of uh, government officials responsible for migration and labor, uh, representatives of some of the major sending countries, uh, international organizations, civil society, and migrants themselves uh, to discuss the situation of migrants living and uh, working in Qatar. And Francois, uh, Francois I wonder if uh, you could share with us uh, some insights, perhaps if we have time now or later on about your visit and your engagement with the with the many stakeholders uh, uh, involved in the build up to to the world cup and perhaps also hear your perspective on the reforms in the um, in labor market regulation uh, that qatari authorities have implemented since your historical visit in 2013 Francois, over to you thank you very much domenico um i'd like also to thank the organizers for inviting me and thank mary for the uh, great um you know, for laying the landscape and, and telling us uh, and situating us within uh, the landscape of sports and human rights. Um, I was in Qatar in November 2013. Um, and uh, I followed after that, uh, I followed what was happening in Qatar, I was interested. Qatar had received so much criticism for its handling of migrant workers. And that was my mandate. So um, this was the reason of my invitation. Qatar, Qatar had not invited really special rapporteurs from the UN before, but facing the criticism, um, and I'll speak here, frankly, they had to show that they were collaborating in changing, you know, the situation. And so they started to invite a number of um, special rapporteurs and Bain was maybe uh, one of the most um, controversial because um, I, wrote a report that um, Qataris generally didn't like uh, because I was telling them that the kafala system had to go, uh, which at the time was not a given. Um, a few words about the kafala system so that uh, we all understand where Qatar has come from. Historically, the kafala is a protection relationship by a Qatari citizen to a foreigner saying, this person is under my protection, please, you know, don't harm that person. That was the historic function of the kafala system. It helps, for example, with doing some the, the form of um, adoption that um, uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, have uh, created, adoption of children or adoption of adults. 
but it has become a mechanism for exploiting uh, foreign workers, unfortunately, and by the millions, we're talking about millions. Um, and there, the, the system is that generally one Qatari citizen, the sponsor, would hire a foreign citizen through generally a recruitment agency. And um, most people whom we call expats, i.e. high wage or maybe mid wage migrant workers, deal with the system correctly because they have some kind of social capital, they ha may have employers that have some, some power in, in the system, etc. But low wage migrant workers, the majority of migrant workers uh, in, in Qatar and in Middle Eastern countries generally, um, do not have that social capital and have suffered greatly from the kafala system. So the challenges for a, a country that is not quite democratic, which relies heavily on the carbon economy, 75% of the budget of Qatar comes from oil and gas. Um, and the fact that the Qatari population, the citizens of Qatar form 10% of the population, migrant workers form 90% of the population of Qatar, uh, and that Qatari citizens are used to privileges. They've been, they've been given privileges by the, by the wealth, oil wealth of Qatar, um, uh, you know, all sorts of privileges. And one of the key issues is that they do not enter the private sector. They have cushioned public service jobs and they have free healthcare, free education, et cetera, et cetera. All this based on all revenues. And so for the, for the Qatar state, it is changing like other GCC countries, with you know, the end of the oil and gas boom looming, less so for Qatar because they have still, I, from what I understand, more than 100 years of gas reserves. Um, but there is a shift to make. They have to, first of all, change the structure of their economy. They have to push Qatari citizens into the private sector. For that, the private sector must be more appealing, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the key issues, one of the key criticisms uh, uh, on Qatar, and Qatar was really in the spotlight in, in 2012, 2013, 2014 for its practices against migrant workers. Um, one of the key elements is re the regulation of the labor market, changing the labor market, and the fact that so many migrants were exploited, that which reduced the cost of labor and served as a subsidy for most of the employers. This had to change. And starting in 2015, Qatar has started to make changes. And I will list a series of changes, and then we can discuss in the Q&A um, you know, whether that changed anything, and we'll see. So in, starting in 2015, first of all, the contract nowadays is not really between the sponsor. The Kafala system has been, in quotation marks, abolished. So the, the relationship is not now, the contractual relationship is not with the sponsor, it's with the recruiter. So the recruiting agency is responsible for the contract, which changes something. The recruiting industry generally for low wage workers, we're not talking about high wage workers who have, you know, headhunters, we're talking about low wage workers. The, the recruiting industry is very problematic. It's, it's formed of multiple agencies, often individual, uh, you know, street corner, people uh, who um, have phone conversations with partners across borders and say, you know, I'll send you a hundred Nepali construction workers. And it's all difficult to monitor and, and have oversight of. So having the recruiters in Qatar being responsible for the relationship reduces the number of people uh, who are responsible for the welfare of migrant workers. And that might allow a better oversight. Um, migrants could not leave the country before without the no objection certificate of the sponsor. And if there was anything that the sponsor didn't like, they could refuse to give the no objection certificate and the and fire the migrant worker. The migrant worker would then be a, um, an undocumented migrant subject to arrest detention and could not leave the country until 
the um, the sponsor agreed, and that was very problematic, and that created pressure and increased the precarity of migrants. So now this is gone. They have the right to leave during the contract, and if for some of them there is a refusal to leave because they, there is a possibility uh, of of the recruiting agency ref telling them that they can't leave now, uh, they have a right of appeal. So that also was, you know, giving the empowering them a little bit more into the system. Uh, they can now change employer during their contract. They could not if they just wanted to stop working for an employer, for example, because of exploitation. Well, they had to uh, leave the contract, be declared a runaway worker, and they had to go back home and then be rehired, which meant immense costs for many of the low wage workers. Um, but now they can change and employers, and that is transformative of the economy because now employers, recruiters, but employers have a domestic labor market where they can recruit people instead of always recruiting from abroad, and that creates you know competition for these workers. Not much the low wage workers, but certainly the mid wage and high wage workers now uh, can choose from employers depending on who's offering the better. Um, working conditions. Um, they improve the rights of domestic workers. For example, the employer has to demonstrate that either they have put the salary in a bank account, which was a huge requirement, usually it was paid in cash by hand, or they have to have a signed receipt from the uh, domestic worker, which guarantees in law that the money has been paid and paid in full in law, might not be in practice. Um, we, we have another problem with the domestic workers in Qatar is that the salary scale depends on your ethnic background. The Filipino domestic worker is paid the most and uh, at the bottom you find Somali or Ethiopian domestic workers. And that is something which is um, uh, not really changed uh, by this new um, system and the employer is prohibited from making deductions to the salary um, in, in terms of costs for um, you know housing or feeding the domestic migrant domestic worker um, qatar in 2018 adopted the permanent residency system so they now allow permanent residency before that um, all foreigners had a one-year residence and work permit renewable. Some had uh, shorter permits, but most of them had, you know, one year permit renewable every year. Some people I've known people who've, li who've lived 40 years in Qatar on a renewable one year permit. Um, now there is a permanent residency mechanism. Uh, if you're born in Qatar and have resided there 10 years, or if you have 20 years of residence in Qatar, you can ask for uh, permanent residents, and you will have the benefits of the citizens in terms, for example, of education and healthcare, but you're not citizen. There's no way still now that anyone can access um, uh, citizenship by naturalization. Um, and also one important element, permanent resident will be provided now for children and non-Qatari husband of Qatari wives and for non-Qatari wives of Qatari citizens which was not the case before, and this changes. It still does not provide citizenship for the children and the hus non qatari husbands of Qatari wives, uh, but at least there is a better uh, system to protect them. Um, foreign, in 2019, there was a change that foreign investors can now have 100% of a business. Before that, they were limited to 49%, and they had to have a Qatari partner owning 51% of the business. Since 2019, they can own 100% of the business. So that also creates a, a, you know, a better um, a business environment, uh, which goes hand in hand, maybe, maybe, with a better labor market regulation. Foreigners can also own some pieces of real estate. That's new, 2019. And 2021, um, there as you know no well, first of all the, the, the before 2021 there are they changed the visa system in 2017 allowing um 95 countries to have a 
visa free or uh, you know facilitated visa access to Qatar. Most of those countries are countries where workers are coming from. Canada is not on that list. Um, but the Philippines, India, Nepal, China are on the list. So that's that's a, also an element, reduces the hassle. And in 2021, Qatar adopted a minimum salary that applies across the board, 20, 275 American dollars per month across the board. Doesn't seem much to most of us, especially those of you who are in Geneva, but it's, um, it's an improvement. And I'm, I was reading that 400,000 uh, migrant workers benefited from that because their salaries increased to that. And that applies to domestic workers as well. So um, all these are improvements. Now, how do um, especially low wage migrants, I'm thinking of domestic workers, I'm thinking of um, uh, construction workers, especially with uh, FIFA coming with all the stadiums and housing that needed to be created for uh, the, the World Cup. Uh, how do they benefit from that? Well, up till now, not much, because in fact, they're not really empowered to uh, use all those mechanisms and, and go after. The, we know that in the human rights, in the history of human rights in the past hundred years, um, no minority group, and I include in that women who were minoritized despite being the majority, um, got their rights on a silver platter. They had to fight for them, all of them, industrial workers, women, indigenous peoples, gays and lesbians, etc. They had to fight for them, and that was difficult. Migrant workers everywhere, it's not only true in Qatar, it's also true in Canada, um, do not have the power to fight for their rights. They don't vote, they have no political traction, um, and they fear being returned home empty handed, which means that sticking your neck out by protesting, contesting, going to court is a risky um, uh, move. And many migrants won't do that. They will try to move on to an employer who will be hopefully better. And um, there's no unions in Qatar. Actually, they could form unions, but they would have to have Qatari citizens as members of the unions. And that's not happening. So there's no unions in Qatar to defend them collectively. Migrants have lots of agency, they have lots of underground networks, but at above ground, there's nothing they can do to collectively defend their rights. And that's very, very difficult. So for, for, um, for migrant workers who are in the low wage category, uh, as long as they're not empowered to fight for their rights, it will, it will still remain difficult. I'll stop there and we'll go to the Q&A for uh, further comments. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Francois, for for such a detailed uh, chronological analysis of quite substantial uh, reforms. It seems uh, it seems to me, at least on on paper, and perhaps um, later on we can also get to the the, the golden question of whether um, the, the 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 win of the bid uh, to host the World Cup has been part of this. Uh, change and and whether the, the the causation can also be linked, of course, to your visit, but uh, also to to the to the um, to the hosting of, of, of such a an important mega sporting events um, event. Uh, let us now continue on this chronological uh, trend and uh, turn to the most recent uh, examination of Qatar by a uh, different UN human rights uh, mechanism this time. And we will do so through a uh, civil and political rights perspe perspective. And for that, I could not be uh, more glad to uh, give the floor to Vasilka Sanchin, uh, Professor of International Law and um, Head of Department uh, of International Law, as well as Director of the Institute for International and International Relations at the University of uh, Ljubljana. An um, important um, added element for this um, for this conversation is the fact that Bajirke is, of course, a member and vice chair of the United Nations 
uh, Human Rights uh, Committee. Uh, just, just over a month ago, Bajilka took part in the initial review of Qatar before the Human Rights Committee. And uh, through uh, an analysis of the session summary records in the last uh, in the last couple of days, uh, preparing for this uh, for this event, uh, references to the upcoming World Cup appear to have been quite quite numerous from both the state parties and the committee's perspective. So, um, Vajirka, it would be particularly interesting to learn more about your engagement during this recent review of Qatar, as well as uh, the implications that the upcoming FIFA World Cup. Um, has had on the constructive dialogue and on the recommendations that ensued from, from the review. Uh, over to you, Vajrika. Thank you very much, Domenico. And I hope you can hear me well. And I would wish to thank the organizers, the Geneva Academy and this uh, human rights platform for inviting me. And um, as probably many of the participants already know, but nevertheless, I will mention that the Human Rights Committee is a treaty body established on the basis of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And its mandate is to also periodically monitor the state parties' compliance with their obligations under this covenant. So Qatar has uh, been one of the more recent um, state parties joining the family of 173 other states. And it has come before the committee uh, in March of this year for its initial review. And I thought it would be um, perhaps good to just mention how this process evolved. So Qatar submitted its initial report in August 2019. Then the committee um, sent to Qatar a list of issues. Uh, Qatar replied in December 2020. Um, in this whole process, we also have received uh, certain submissions and additional information, both from the National Human Rights Institution of Qatar, as well as of some non-governmental organizations. And they have been mentioning the problems that Francois so nicely um, already presented. Um, then uh, Qatar replied um, to these questions, as I said, and the dialogue started in on the 28th of February and ended uh, on the 1st of March, as is usual. So it lasts for two days, two slots of three hours. In the... Um, introductory speech of the head of the Qatari delegation, Mr. Al-Hamadi already mentioned various improvements in preparation for the uh, World Cup of this year. Um, and then based on the dialogue and many of the questions of the members of the committee concern also the situation of migrant workers involved in especially uh, constructing the facilities for the World Cup, um, the Qatari delegation also provided some additional information. And I would also like to mention that the Human Rights Committee uh, has introduced and regularly applies the so-called follow-up procedure to concluding observations, which means that it identifies three recommendations on which it expects to receive in additional information on what has been done to follow the recommendation within three years time. So in 2025, the committee will hopefully receive information from uh, Qatari authorities, what has been specifically done on the three issues that are mentioned here. So the issue of death penalty, the death among migrant workers and participation in public affairs. And all of these issues basically has already been at least uh, indirectly touched upon by Francois. So in um, the concluding observations that were issued by the Human Rights Committee, uh, the committee first recognized certain positive developments, certain positive aspects uh, in Qatar, which um, in my personal opinion, are mostly the result of their successful bid for the World Cup 2022. So in that sense, I would say that winning a bid for a mega sporting event does in a way um, can lead to positive developments also in the field of human rights. So the committee welcomed the adoption of various legislative uh, acts or other measures that are mentioned here, including the provisions on entry, exit, and residency of foreigners, uh, 
uh, then increasing penalties for violations of the wage protection system, the minimum wage that was mentioned, and also a special law in regulating categories of workers uh, that can leave the country without an exit permit. Now, in the relevant uh, paragraphs that specifically tackle the situation of migrant works, workers in Qatar, uh, the committee emphasized um, that despite all these positive developments, there are still concerning reports that the migrant workers are specifically suffering from heat stress and which in several occasions arise in deaths and that um, there, there, there is a, a problem with uh, access to an effective remedy uh, because there is basically very little statistics on how efficient these measures that were put in place actually are. Um, and specifically, the committee asked that it wishes to receive more information in, uh, concerning the preparation for the 2022 Football World Cup. Um, it is important that, uh, as it is usual, the structure first, the concern, and then the recommendation. In the recommendation, the committee did not only ask Qatar to continue these positive developments, but to intensify its efforts to prevent deaths of migrant workers, um, including on construction sites, um, and also uh, to, to ensure that um, the relevant legal framework um, is actually effective. So that investigations uh, of workplace incidents are regularly conducted and that uh, the families have the ability to receive reparations. Further, concerning discrimination, exploitation, and abuse of migrant workers, um, despite the information that the kafala system that was already presented has been abolished, there are still certain concerns with regard to exclusion of certain categories of workers, such as construction workers, and uh, special uh, kind of um, arrangements uh, for works that are necessary to be done despite the wish of uh, the migrant worker perhaps to, to leave the country. So um, in that respect, again, the committee asked Qatar to intensify its efforts to ensure that um, this legislation is um, enforced, uh, including to address all the issues of abuse um, through regular labor inspections to properly investigate, prosecute, and punish, so sanction abusive employers and recruitment companies and provide reparations. And especially what is important, and Francois also highlighted that the Qatari authorities have a positive obligation, so they need to take positive measures to provide access to effective legal remedies for protection of migrant workers. Uh, in a way that they will not fear any reprisals or even less detention or deportation if they use these uh, legal remedies. And finally, I thought it was also important to highlight that um, one of the um, concerns that came up in this dialogue with Qatar, also on the basis of the information received from the civil society, was that the trafficking in persons in the state party is very closely connected to the issue of uh, migrant workers, and that there is very limited information on trafficking in persons, uh, and especially how the state party is actually addressing this phenomena. And for these reasons, again, the committee asked it to intensify its efforts to prevent trafficking and punish those responsible, especially that we wish to receive a more precise um, statistical data on trafficking cases in order to be able to better address the situation. Uh, and of course, again, the need for thorough investigation and appropriate sentences and full reparations and means of protection for the victims. Now, no mega sporting event can be organized without um, substantial additional investments, um, both from governments, but also pro from the private sector. In this respect, I think it is very important to say that although the 
major human rights treaties, including the Covenant, do not um, bind directly uh, companies. Of course, the obligations are on the states, but nevertheless, the states do have an obligation to oversee what the private sector is doing in order to ensure that the fundamental human rights on the basis of each respective treaty are in effect respected. And in this sense, I think it's very positive that we see various developments, including um, the efforts to promote the so-called sustainable investing, which means that human rights are taken into account very early on, as was mentioned by uh, Mary Harvey at the beginning. And this is something that perhaps can be brought more to the fore in these dialogues, also with the Human Rights Committee, through the participation of civil society organizations. So there is a room for discussion on these issues. And I would wish to encourage the civil society organizations following um, these mega sporting events to perhaps think what are the relevant aspects that they would wish to bring forward to the attention of the committee when dealing with particular states parties. Thank you. This will be all for my initial presentation. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vajika, uh, for this analysis of uh, the most re recent um, examination of Qatar's um, civil, civil, civil and political rights. And uh, we can already see how um, an event of the magnitude of such as the FIFA World Cup does indeed seem to push for for uh, policy change uh, at least uh, at least on paper and uh, it would be interesting then to um, take a closer look at at, at implementation um, standards uh, in country during during the q a uh, perhaps uh, as i mentioned in the in the um, in the chat if um, if uh, any of the participants have questions you can start posting them on on the chat, I'll be collecting them uh, with the help of our colleague uh, Zena Baveva here in in the room, and and um, um, and we'll be able to to then uh, pose those questions during the the Q and A. Um, as covered throughout these first presentations, uh, it's clear that the delivery of uh, FIFA World Cup tournaments involve considerable uh, human rights implications, especially for the rights of workers involved in construction sites and uh, supply chains. This should imply that, for example, when constructing sports infrastructure for the event, workers are duly paid, have decent working schedules and conditions, and that supply chains are free from forced labor. And uh, now I have the great honor to give the floor to the world expert on, on these issues, uh, Professor Justin Nolan uh, from the Faculty of Law and Justice at the University of New South Wales and Director of the uh, Australian Human Rights Institutes. Um, Institute. Justin's research uh, focuses on the intersection of business and uh, human rights, in particular uh, supply chain responsibility for human rights and modern slavery. And her 2019 book addressing uh, modern slavery um, examines how consumers, business and government are both part of the problem and the solution in curbing modern slavery in global supply chains. So Justine's contribution today will allow um, to broaden our conversation by applying the fundamental business and, and human rights lens and the concept of human rights due diligence to the delivery of mega sporting events such as the upcoming Qatar and the uh, Australia New Zealand FIFA World Cup. Uh, thank you uh, once again Justine for agreeing to join us from Sydney at this late hour, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, thank you for your kind invitation to the Geneva Academy. Um, having listened to the, the great interventions from the earlier speakers, um, it gives me a little opportunity to try and bring it together before we have more of a discussion, um, because each of them has touched on some of the really pertinent connections between human rights, sport, um, and these sort of mega events. So I do want to focus on the role of the private sector um, in these events, but I also want to take it a little bit broader and and draw that comparison as we move from, you know, looking at Qatar this year to then the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023. And many people might say, what we've seen over the last decade is a whole slay of concerns that have been raised around Qatar. And um, in particular, Francois and his research and his reports has really um, highlighted the plight of migrant workers, um, particularly in the construction sector, which has been a real, um, 
issue around as the, the focus on the development of infrastructure um, for this. And one might say, oh, well, when we move to Australia and New Zealand, then those problems disappear. You know, that we don't have the really serious human rights issues that have been raised in relation to Qatar. But, you know, really that's not the case, um, that many, many of the issues that are associated with mega sporting events move with the country. So the issues that we saw in Beijing, the issues that we've seen in Qatar, in Qatar are different from those that we all see in um, Australia and New Zealand, but that we still have some problematic issues that will arise. Um, there's been a recent sort of risk assessment done in relation to Australia and New Zealand World Cup event by the Australian Human Rights Commission, and it highlighted some of these issues. And one of them was exactly that around migrant workers. Um, some of these same issues that um, Francois noted, um, Pre-COVID, about 11% of Australia and New Zealand's workforce is made up of migrant workers. And when you're going to hold something like a mega supporting event, that share of the labour market becomes much larger um, in relation to areas like construction, cleaning, hospitality, security. These industries are dominated by migrant workers or those on, on sort of contract workers. And so they tend to be workers who are more vulnerable in place positions. So while the situation may be different from Qatar, it's very different, we don't have a Kapala system, there are in Australia and New Zealand also some of the same vulnerabilities and um, precariousness around that work. And that is something that organisations like FIFA have to take into account and not sort of rest assured that moving to uh, a different country, will they, they will escape that problems. So some of those same areas of risk are, um, are going to be apparent. And... As the so other speakers have noted, not only is there an obligation in relation to governments on these, but there's an obligation on, in relation to the sporting organisation itself and also those companies who are involved. So those companies might be delivering the services, um, providing the construction, providing hospital, um, hospitality workers, um, but they also may be sponsors of an event. And so they may be directly and indirectly involved in facilitating worker exploitation um, in these events. And that responsibility and preventative nature is incumbent on an organisation like FIFA um, to engage with business in a way that engages with human rights due diligence so that you are looking to prevent a problem and not just react and set up a grievance me mechanism once uh, a problem occurs. So this, this area of mega sporting events is really this confluence of government and non-government sort of non-state actor responsibilities. The UN guiding principles on business and human rights really you know, clearly delineate state obligations and companies' responsibilities to respect. But one thing that sports law and mega sporting events do is, is sometimes that they sort of, they have this notion that everyone is responsible. And sometimes where everyone is responsible, then no one is responsible. And that's what we uh, have seen, I'd say, particularly with mega sporting events, that there's this deflection of um, accountability in relation to it. Governments look to business, business looks to government, others will look to the, the, uh, the sporting organisation itself. And everybody is, 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 is fairly busy deflecting, depending what the problem is um, that occurs in relation to it. So one risk that we need to really be concerned about, no matter where the event is held, um, is sort of the, the impact on the workers um, who are delivering, who are in essence delivering it. Another issue that I think that we need to be concerned about um, that we haven't discussed so much so far is the rights of the players themselves, particularly um, both in terms of their involvement uh, in, an, in, a, in a country like Qatar, um, but also in Australia and New Zealand. So different concerns will arise. So in somewhere like Qatar, you might be looking at, and we saw this also in the Beijing Olympics, the rights of players to freely express themselves um, and freely speak uh, within the confines of that event. But beyond that, and as we look to Australia and New Zealand and the Women's World Cup, it's also the rights of players if something goes wrong to realise remedy. And this is where we sort of see mega sporting events operate as this sort of autonomy of sports law that is that doesn't fit well and sits outside both the UN mechanisms and often state-based remedial mechanisms. Um, you know, sport itself and global sports law is sort of recognised as this, this transnational legal order. What it has meant in many cases is that athletes themselves 
do not have the right to an effective remedy in many of these events. Um, we are seeing some changes come in relation to this, but some of the changes that FIFA has proposed in recent years are looking at the institution of grievance mechanisms for workers. So looking at um, within the construction and the infrastructure around that, but not always considering players as part of that um, field of workers. In many, for many elite, elite athletes around the world, we'll see that they're basically forced into a system of arbitration when they sign on to representing their country or you know, being part of this major event, they are often signing away their rights to seek remedies in other areas. Many sporting bodies, FIFA included, um, the Olympics or you know, obviously included, um, have uh, many shortfalls in relation to where players are not having access to remedy and where players are suffering human rights harm, there's not an effective system yet for them to seek remedy. The Court of Arbitration and Sport um, has many positives, but is not a human rights specialist body. And we're not seeing it work smoothly and clearly alongside human rights mechanisms. And I would argue that in many cases, elite athletes are sort of falling through a loop in relation to that. This is an area where we move to Australia and New Zealand. FIFA has a real opportunity to be a leader um, in relation to this, not only in 2023, but also as we look to 2026 to remedy and to take care of um, players as we move into this area. The other issue I think that we need to think about as we um, look at these mega sporting events and the connections with human rights are the involvement of key um, groups in those countries of concern. So as we look to Australia and New Zealand, we would look in, in particular to the impact and involvement in collaboration with Australia and New Zealand's Indigenous people that moves beyond a sort of tokenistic acknowledgement of their rights within the country and the land on which these events are being held, but looks at real collaboration. So for example, in Australia, um, there's a movement uh, led by Indigenous peoples uh, looking to uh, give Indigenous peoples a voice within our country. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is something that FIFA as an organisation should be looking to support um, in 2023. It should be looking to fund and uh, involve Indigenous peoples in the sport as, um, as we move on. In particular, another group that these organisations should be looking at as we develop um, and you know, try and avoid human rights harms is ensuring uh, more vulnerable groups, that's the rights of disabled persons, are involved in the co-design of these events. So not involved as an afterthought, um, sort of looking at infrastructure or involved in committees, but very much from the outset are, you know, sort of co-designing collaborators um, with these mega sporting events. I think there's many positives um, that these sporting organisations are starting to think about, but a lot of the time we're still seeing them being reactive. So waiting for the problem to occur and then thinking about, you know, how do we deal with this grievance rather than adopting a human rights due diligence approach, which is looking at preventing this problem by really engaging rights holders in the process. So this is incumbent not only on the sports organisations, but also on every business that is involved in any aspect of a mega sporting event, um, whether it be a sponsor, whether it be a provider of goods and services, that there is a clear responsibility to respect human rights and that you can't outsource that responsibility by expecting either the sporting organisation or the government um, within that area to take that. It's very much a complementary um, set of responsibilities that we have here. So, you know, raising all those sort of many issues, Dominica, I think there are, I've raised a number of issues in that that we'd like to think about. Um, but the, the clear role of business in mega sporting events is massive. Um, and it has, it, it is as impactful and as important as governments in relation to that. So I'll leave it there and um, look forward to the questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Justine. It was a uh, such a such a precious precious contribution to to this discussion, and I'm sure also our friends from the Sports and Human Rights Center uh, have been there uh, noting down all these very um, detailed and and, and extremely uh, extremely useful recommendations uh, for the future of uh, mega sporting events uh, moving from what is currently in place a sort of uh, reactive uh, system of um, well reactions to to, to grievances to uh, um, all, all inclusive uh, due diligence uh, um, 
approach, including uh, minorities also that that are also specific of those of the of the host countries um, uh, where where mega sporting events are being uh, are being held. Um, thank you so much. Um, you've also uh, highlighted another element of the uh, human rights uh, ecology, national ecology that uh, that we have not mentioned yet, and that is the important role of national human rights institutions and the um, historical uh, involvement of the Australian Human Rights Commission in uh, in um, developing a human rights impact assessment, uh, which, which uh, we might also uh, want to discuss during the Q&A. Um, so now the floor is open for questions from the audience. We have a good uh, half an hour and um, I see that uh, a number of questions have already been posed through the chat. I wonder, however, whether um, any of um, the participants would like to pose uh, questions uh, from, from the floor first. And if, um, if you do have uh, questions to our three speakers, but of course as well to, uh, to, to Mary, um, please uh, do so. You can raise your hand or uh, indeed um, turn your camera on. That would, be, that would make the conversation a little bit more friendly rather than just seeing uh, boxes with your names. So that would that would be that would be very um, useful for us as well. So the floor is open. I'm um, monitoring now the participants list, seeing whether there's any um, hands raised. And yes, there is a question from one of our guest uh, speakers. Uh, so Vajika, please. Thank you. Um, and of course, uh, I hope I did not uh, zerp uh, <laughs> the right to speak first. Um, but um, I think it's very important to look not only at the um, events leading up to the mega sporting event and as uh, the last speaker emphasized the rights of the sportsmen and sportswomen, but also how the states handle the sporting events themselves and the aftermath of the sporting events. In this respect, I just wanted to mention that I think um, it is um, very important to, for example, look at the Human Rights Committee's general comment number 37, which deals with the right of peaceful assembly, because the people who gather to follow a mega sporting event uh, do qualify as a peaceful assembly, and the states have certain obligations how to treat all those uh, spectators and, uh, and other participants. And even if uh, they then gather after the sporting events outside on the streets of the city, still there are very, um, I think, clear guidance in this general comment on how the authorities should tackle such assemblies. In fact, sport is even specifically uh, mentioned in the general comment itself. So I think we have to look at the whole spectrum, preparations of the sporting event, the actual event and the aftermath of the event through this human rights lens. And I would perhaps like to hear the thoughts of the other speakers on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vajilka. And um, uh, I will um, start reading some of the questions that are coming in um, in the chat. Um, we have, um, I'll read two more questions and then perhaps we can go um, maybe using the opposite order. Uh, so starting with Justine and Vajilka and then Francois uh, in, terms of, in terms of reply. So of course we have Vajilka's question. The second question is, um, has been posed by Milun Kotari. Um, and um, Milun is asking what can be done uh, with countries that do not follow human rights guidelines even though they may be men mentioned in the bid. What if human rights violations continue? How can the UN human rights system remain effective? This is the uh, first question. And then the second question, which is a question specifically directed at uh, Francois, are the new legislative measures aimed at um, providing protections to the foreign workers implemented or have they, or do they remain on paper in Qatar? So three questions, perhaps if um, Justine wishes to go first, if that's okay, and then we go up to uh, Vajilka and uh, uh, finally Francois. Um, well, I'll, I'll um, address the, the question that came around the, uh, you know, what happens if they promise everything that they're going to do and they don't follow in relation to the bid. Um, you know, that's the story of human rights, right? <laughs> that everybody signs the treaty 
uh, and then we find out that you know actually they're not they're not following through with their obligations. And so you know much like the international human rights system, um, when when there's a bid, there is this notion of consent and you know this obligation that you're going to do as you you know as you've promised. But there is not this hard hard and fast enforcement rule uh, in relation to these aspects. Much of the you know international human rights system is is built on dialogue and naming and shaming, and to many you know in many ways so is the in relation to the mega sporting events as well. Um, it's a system of reputation, um, but this is also where business could come into it um, because business itself, um, I would argue, has a responsibility even if the state is not following through its obligations to respect human rights. So if it is involved in a, you know, in, in a sporting event that is actively discriminating or is um, you know, punishing athletes for not allowing them to speak up, um, this is where businesses need to walk away. Um, in this instance, where they need to use the power, their leverage of sponsorship to say, to indicate that this is not acceptable. Um, businesses have such an impact on mega sporting events. They simply would not run without their money. Um, and so the leverage of business can't be um, underestimated. Obviously, the primary obligation here is on the state uh, to do it. But as with human rights, there is this system of dialogue and consent uh, as to get things along. So I think it's using... It's looking at how you might use leverage. Um, and also the idea of sort of human rights due diligence is that it's this ongoing process. It's not just something that goes into a bid and there's no monitoring, there's no accountability. Um, it will be hopefully a, a system built on over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. I'll, I'll um, pass the floor so to, to Vajilka. The question for, for Francois on, on the, um, the new legislative measures, whether they've been implemented or not, could indeed be also uh, posed to you as the, the, the most uh, recent uh, examiner of, 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 uh, of um, Qatar's um, policies. So, um, Vajilka, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Um, just to add to what Justine um, said, I think what is important uh, in these circumstances where we have no uh, really enforcement mechanism for human rights is that there is this periodicity of the monitoring. And for I highlighted that um, in the recent review of Qatar, among the three selected recommendations for follow-up, so in the next three years, is the one relating to the treatment of migrant workers, especially, of course, in connection with the World Cup 2022. So, and this period, periodicity of monitoring puts an extra pressure on the state because it knows that this issue will not go away. The human rights mechanisms will be coming back to this issue and then the states uh, perhaps are through this uh, approach further encourage to uh, safeguard their reputation, international reputation, which is something the states, most of them do care about. <laughs> now we can discuss, of course, given the current situation in the world, to what extent, but in principle. And as to the whether the Qatari laws are being implemented in the practice, as you have seen in the recommendations issued by the committee, um, not to a sufficient extent. So while the legislative framework has been improved and certain acts have been adopted, uh, the implementation and practice is still uh, insufficient and therefore the committee asked for intensification of efforts uh, in order to uh, reach a state where this would be in compliance with the Qatari obligations under the uh, ICCPR. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll pass the floor to Francois for his um, reply. Yes. Um, uh, as uh, Justine said, I mean, the, 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 the history of human rights is about making pledges and following up several years later, <laughs> sometimes decades later. And the human rights doctrine is constantly evolving. The, those who drafted the Universal Declaration never thought about same-sex rights, et cetera, et cetera. So it's evolving constantly, it's deepening. So the, the, um, what we can take from that is that uh, it's not going to be solved in one go. It, it's a continuing issue that we must deal with constantly. Um, yeah, there are three ways in, in which um, you can enforce human rights standards 
First, there's a complaint mechanism. That works well for people with social capital. If uh, Justine, for example, starts not being paid by her university, there will be a complaint to a labor board, to a human rights commission, to something. That's because social capital is like that. Same for me at McGill. It usually doesn't work for people with little or no social capital because of the risks involved in sticking your neck out. So I would say that the vast majority of workers in, in Qatar, for example, as well as this, the workers in similar situations in Canada, will not make complaints. Will not make complaints because the risk is that they'll be uh, detected, eventually arrested, detained, deported. And that's a risk they don't want to take because themselves, their families, their village has invested too much in their being there and being able to send remittances back. And taking the risk of being sent back empty handed is something that they will not want to do because they have parents to, to, you know, for whom they have to pay medical bills, they have children to feed and to educate, etc. And they won't take the risk. So complaint mechanisms for people who do not have or have little social capital do not work. And that's true in Qatar, but it's true in Australia and Canada as well. The second are inspections. That's what works for people without uh, social capital. Now, for um, mo in most countries, and that includes Canada, I imagine it's the same in Australia, I haven't done that research, um, labor inspections are useless for migrant workers. Very often, labor inspectors uh, work hand in hand with immigration. And if you have undocumented migrant workers, and if you have migrant workers with very precarious status, um, that can be, uh, that's a risk they, they will not. So they will not call the labor inspectors. And labor inspectors, when they come and visit, will um, participate in hunting down the migrants who should not be there. And so labor inspections do not work. In Qatar, when I was there, it's changed now, all 150 labor inspectors uh, who were overseeing 60,000 businesses, which shows you the discrepancy, they were all migrant workers with a one-year permit. They were not going to uh, criticize the system. Now, this has changed. The Qatar has Qatarized the labor inspection regime. It's now Qatari citizens, I'm told. I've, I've read that. I haven't checked. I haven't been back in Qatar. Um, and they have increased the number to 150 or 300 uh, inspectors. It's, you know, if these labor inspectors are, are doing their job at protecting migrant workers, uh, it's good. Uh, if they are, if they consider themselves privileged Qatari citizens that uh, want to maintain the type of system that has prevailed in, in Qatar, well, it won't work. And so inspections are difficult, but that's true everywhere. For example, inspections for uh, in, in my bar association in, in Quebec for lawyers who swindle migrants uh, do not work. And no migrant will, will ever make a complaint against a lawyer. They wield too much power. So people are swindled from $2,000 of, of $2,000. The lawyer doesn't do anything. They find themselves in a dire situation. They go and see another lawyer. That's what they do. And finally, there is the reputational risk. And I think that's what worked with Qatar. And that's what, for example, the UPR is doing at the UN. You, you have, and that is the key element of the human rights doctrine. States have to justify what they do. And that justification can be painful. Uh, I remember meeting a Canadian representative who's, who presented a report to the Human Rights Committee um, that was many years ago, and had been grilled on, on poverty for women and children and on indigenous people's uh, positions in Canada. And she came back saying, either the government changes something or I quit because I don't want to go through that again. And so that thing is important. You can change something if you, if you uh, first of all, attack the reputation. And I think Qatar was very wary of its reputation. And second, uh, if you um, aim at the reformers within uh, the system, because the reformers will have plans to change what's wrong, they will wait for the right minister to come into place, but they will have plans to do that. And if we aim at them, something can change. Now, 
things, I think the, the bottom line is that things will not change unless people are empowered to push for those changes and migrant workers are not. Just to give you a comparison, in Canada, in Quebec and Ontario, agricultural workers do not have the right to unionize. It's been prohibited by law because we all know that those agricultural workers are mostly migrant workers. And the two governments of Quebec and Ontario felt that, you know, it would be better if they were not unionizing. And to me, to show that Canada is doing that, well, no wonder Qatar is doing that as well in a different way. So we have to empower these individuals and that is the most difficult thing. And this is why the answer to the third question, um, the legislations might change things when there's no need for um, uh, empowering migrants. For example, the, the minimum wage requirement might be implemented in great part. But if you, if you think of domestic workers who live in a household isolated without public transit, um, with maybe one visit to the mall every week, um, if they're not paid the minimum wage, who's going to know? And so that is where empowerment is key. They have to have an association. They have to be able to speak. They have to have a cell phone. Many employers of domestic workers are confiscating cell phones. So this is the kind of thing that needs to change in order for migrant workers to be able to speak up and, and change the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francois. And uh, um, if I may also um, give the floor, Mary, sorry, I did, I did not uh, uh, forget you at all. It's, uh, uh, we, we were taking the, 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 the questions for the, the panelists first, but of course, what would be your, um, um, your um, approach to the question on how to ensure that, that host actors implement uh, human rights commitments once, uh, uh, once the bid is won? And of course, your your experience, your personal experience with the 2026 World Cup would be extremely useful to, to, to learn more about. Okay, well, thank you for that. I'll, I'll be brief. First of all, it starts with the sports governing body that's issuing the, the, the bidding process. Having that bidding process be transparent, having the bidding documents completely and the bidding requirements out in the public domain, including the human rights requirements. Um, secondly, is that when the bids are responded to, that the, those documents are also made public, right? So it's a matter of public record, which gives not only, um, it, it gives civil society and others something to anchor their, their work into, right? So if they can see what's been committed to, then they have an opportunity to engage around those commitments. Um, the third thing is, is that at the same time that sports bodies are putting uh, human rights into the bidding criteria, it's also putting human rights language into key contracts that are required to host a mega sporting event. Those are hosting contracts, host city agreements, stadium agreements, airport agreements, stadium agreements, uh, training facility agreements, uh, sourcing codes, all of that. And what that does is all of that embeds leverage indirect leverage by simply having it in the court of public opinion. So everybody is aware what the commitments are, but also uh, legalistic from, from a legal standpoint, ensuring that those commitments are in these key contracts. So that then when there is um, a lack of, you know, execution, um, that there's, there's remedy, there's remedy available in terms of, you know, legal remedy. So just, just a couple Thank thoughts. Thank you very much. I, I, I unfortunately, I, mute, I muted myself. And uh, yes, by now everybody should know when to un unmute. Um, apologies for that. And yes, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Mary. And um, I will now uh, turn to uh, another set of, um, of questions. Um, so the first uh, question of the second round is about the role and liabilities of uh, FIFA or the um, IOC uh, in relation with host countries. Um, so would this be a question of liability separately or collectively? And the second question, the following question would be, should FIFA slash the IOC be treated like business or quasi uh, state actors? This is um, the, first, uh, the first question. 
Um, there is then a, a question also for uh, general discussion. Um, recognizing general limitations of practical enforcement mechanisms, are there other positive vehicles that can or should be considered, such as sharing of best practices amongst and between states that have hosted large events? Um, for example, working groups of countries can discuss and exchange with each other on what has worked well in their countries, what has not worked so well, and various experiences, etc. Um, is there any practicality to this within this space? I will also um, read a, um, a, a second, um, a third, sorry, a third um, consideration rather than a question, and then I'll um, return the floor to our speakers. Um, this is from Gadi Spickering, um, uh, who says that uh, um, the state has the, uh, so in agreement with Francois, the state has the primary obligation to ensure the protection and promotion of the rights of the people. If the state does not fulfill this obligation, then it cannot be shifted onto other entities. However, businesses have an obligation in terms of the UNGPs, uh, the, the guiding principles, to work with states to ensure rights are not violated through their business um, conduct. So um, these are two questions and one consideration. Perhaps we can uh, start with uh, Francois, Vajilka, Justine, and then uh, Mary, if um, there's, um, yes, um, anyone wishes to take the floor after that. Yes, please, Francois. Um. Uh, thank you. Uh, about the uh, issue of enforcement mechanisms and sharing of best practices and lessons learned. Uh, yes, absolutely. States are always welcoming uh, ideas that will allow them to realize their objectives. Now, their objectives are not always to protect migrant workers. It might be to sewage fears, it might be to um, uh, you know, a sewage, the fears of the investors, of the international organizations, etc. So we have to, to, to see what can be done. Now, collect, sharing best practices um, in terms of migrant workers has been exactly what uh, the global compact on migration has, how, how it's come about. The global compact on migration uh, was a, is a um, General Assembly resolution, basically, um, that was adopted in 2018 in Marrakesh that uh, uh, covers the whole of the migration regime, most of it, let's say, and provides guidance to states for the future in terms of how to govern migration. And there are many things in there that are, you know, self-evident, like, you know, respect labor law, which is one of the problems. The labor code of Qatar is quite good. It's, you know, it's taken from, you know, the general labor codes of most countries. It's quite good, except that it's not implemented. And I would say it's the same in Canada for agricultural workers or, or, or undocumented workers and, and for some temporary migrant workers as well. So there are there is a process, for example, on migration where the Global Compact on Migration with its follow-up and, and the first meeting, review meeting, will be next month in Geneva after four years. So there, there are issues there that can be discussed. And certainly many states have good practices on one or two points or a bit more, and they can share that. So that to me is a, certainly a way forward. It's been a way forward that's been used by, by around the world since, since the Universal Declaration. Um, second, the role of business uh, in the protect to help states. I want to mention one thing, which is that several companies, and I'm mentioning companies in the um, in in the in Kuwait. I know of one company in Kuwait, an American construction company in Kuwait, that has a, a migrant worker welfare department, and that migrant welfare migrant worker welfare department has worked with the company to show that protecting migrant workers actually helps the bottom line of the company. And that to me is a key element. We have to make the business case for protecting the rights of migrant workers and empowering migrant workers. Yes, you might have unionization. That's the big scare for most businesses. But at the same time, you might have 
a regulated collective bargaining mechanism, you might have a much better um, a trained workforce, a workforce that doesn't change constantly and that you have to replace constantly, et cetera, et cetera. There are benefits for businesses. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Francois. And I see that uh, we're close um, to the um, to the end of, of, of this session. So if I can ask Vajilka uh, and Justine to to be um, brief in their in their reactions, please. I'm um, sorry for that. And um, I will then pass the floor also to to, to Mary. Vajilka, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the was whether FIFA and um, International Olympic Committee could be considered as quasi-state actors. Well, not in terms of the uh, fundamental human rights treaties, because these are binding on states, well, with one exception <laughs> that it's binding also on the European Union, but the FIFA and the International Olympic Committee are not um, in this category, so to have direct human rights obligations under these treaties. Nevertheless, they have been adopting more and more so their own human rights policies and, and uh, other strategic documents. And I think that in certain instances where these organizations detect serious human rights violations or potential serious human rights uh, violations, they have a very important voice that they can raise. And let me just very quickly mention one example. So in 2020, in May, actually, Qatar um, de facto ended its moratorium, which was upheld in, since 2000, with the execution on, of one Nepali migrant worker. And here there were concerns raised by the civil society that the execution was actually carried out because the victim of the murder was a Qatari citizen. While uh, the other migrant workers who were also accused of murders, but of other, let's say, foreign citizens, um, were uh, given different penalties. So these are the kind of issues that I think also FIFA and other organizations involved in these mega sporting invites should um, be uh, following very closely and raising their voice when events such as this occur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vajilka. And I'll, um, yes, pass the floor to Justine, please. Um, just to break briefly around the question of sort of what's the status of FIFA in relation to this. FIFA is not a state, it's um, not a business, it's a nonprofit, but the UN guiding principles refer generally to business enterprises. So that includes nonprofits, it includes lawyers and consultants, et cetera. So the sort of the, the responsibility around um, that the UN guiding principles of business and human rights talk about does apply to FIFA. And we should remember that the responsibility to respect human rights doesn't increase or decrease depending on whether states meet their own duties, that these are complementary, um, you know, and supplementary obligations that sit alongside each other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. And um, now, if I, if I may also give the floor to, um, to Mary to react to, to this series of questions after which uh, we will have to uh, come to, to, to a close. Um, I will then, of course, ask all the panelists uh, uh, to, if, if they would like to give a final, final, final remarks before the closing. But first of all, uh, Mary, for, some, uh, for a reaction. No, no I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, so FIFA in particular, FIFA's human rights policy uh, elaborates, it's made a statutory commitment to respect human rights. And it also uh, outlines its approach and, and implementation of its human rights commitments in accordance with the UNGPs. So you, FIFA has made an affirmative statement uh, on the UN guiding principles. And also I refer to the Ruggie report for the game for the world. If you've not read it, please do. Uh, and it also provides, uh, and the fact that international sports associations like FIFA do conduct significant levels of com commercial activity puts them into the realm of, of basically pillar two. So that's just, again, that's from the Ruggie report, um, just to be very clear on that. I'll stop now because I wanna give time to the panelists, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. And um, I'll just use this opportunity to, to um, also mention something that relates to what, uh, to what uh, Justine said in terms of moving from a a reactive to a, a proactive system in terms of uh, hosting uh, mega sporting events and and their implications in terms of, of, of human rights violations. The um, uh, 
the uh, historical uh, United 2026 um, human rights strategy uh, spearheaded by Mary uh, does indeed uh, do that in terms of um, in terms of uh, highlighting uh, human rights risk assessments uh, for the specific um, cities uh, uh, that would host uh, the, the, the the FIFA World Cup 2026. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, at the, the closing of, of this session, if you could just spend just one minute or perhaps less on, 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 on the implications of this important uh, new uh, initiative. Um, we have now uh, come to uh, 3.30, the end of this extremely interesting and vibrating session. Thank you all for uh, joining us and uh, thank you to uh, all the panelists uh, for being uh, with us today. We have touched upon how different UN human rights mechanisms have, uh, um, um, have dealt with uh, issues pertaining to the human rights implications of um, uh, one World Cup, uh, the, the one that is upcoming now in 2022 in Qatar, but we've also touched upon the role of national human rights actors such as the National Human Rights Institution and its role in uh, devising a human rights impact assessment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, Australia-New Zealand um, World Cup in 2023. Um, we uh, have also seen that mega sporting events could potentially be a megaphone for uh, human rights promotion and protection and the many different elements that could leverage uh, this uh, megaphone is up to uh, all of us uh, human rights um, uh, well academics uh, members of, of uh, committees uh, experts as well as businesses and um, the, the the public at large um, I would like to offer a possibility for a closing from, from the panelists, uh, and then I will go give the floor to Mary as well, uh, and uh, we will close the session after that. So I will give the first, first the floor to Francois, Vajika, Justine, uh, followed by, by Mary. Just one word, migrant workers need empowerment. That's true for Qatar, but that's true for Canada, that's true everywhere, um, and they are, Many of those migrant workers are today in the exact position of industrial workers for which unions were created in the 19th and early 20th century. And so there is a need for empowering them by allowing them to get together and, and push back against exploitation. I'll stop there. Thank you, Francois. Vajilka, over to you. Um, just quickly, I think it's very important to really keep an eye on the entire process of mega sporting events, um, even the aftermath of these events, and of course the role of all the stakeholders uh, working together is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Vajilka. Justine, over to you. Um, just to highlight a, a point that Mary made earlier around the power of sporting events to advance human rights, but the really key aspect is around transparency around transparency around working conditions, transparencies of contract, transparency around the rights of players. I think that will, as you know, the more that we, that is out there in the public domain, the more that um, the sporting events can be held accountable to advance rights. And I really look forward to seeing you all in 2023 at the FIFA World Cup. And Mary, we look forward to hosting you down here if you're gonna make it down. I'd love to. Thank you, thank you, Justine. Uh, Mary, you've been you've been called uh, for reaction, so please. Uh, the last uh, the last um, yes word is is to you, and then I will close the the meeting up to you. So I'm going to speak in terms of the perspective of being once in the shoes of bidding to host one of these events, and I just want to talk briefly about the role of transparency. When I went to the head of the bid and I said, "We have to talk about things that we don't want to talk about." We have to talk about guns. We have to talk about, we're like, we don't want to talk about guns. So we have to talk about the Muslim ban. We don't want to talk about the Muslim ban, right? We're competing. We want to host this thing. And I said, unless you do those things, you know, we're going to be accused of not getting it, about, about not understanding what the risks are. And so the fact that the bidding requirements and the way we respond to them would be public it enabled me to have that conversation inside the bid team and for them to say, you know what, you're right. Because if we don't say these things and we don't really address the risks, 
then it's going to look like we don't understand. We don't get it. So I think, and, and I guess the, the second key enabler was stakeholder engagement. What we wanted was, was a human rights strategy that when we put it forward, the fingerprints of civil society would be all over it. The fingerprints of Human Rights Watch, the fingerprints of the ACLU, the fingerprints of the AFL-CIO, which is the labor uh, union, they would be all over this. Um, and in that way, if you're competing to host a mega sporting event, potentially in, a, in an administration that was very controversial during this time, if a reporter called up and said, what do you think of this human rights strategy coming out you know, with Donald Trump as president, the United States, in addition to Canada and Mexico, I wanted a response from Human Rights Watch and the AFL-CIO and the ACLU and Human Rights Campaign to say, our fingerprints are all over that. We've participated in it, we engaged in it, We've had our concerns heard and addressed, and we feel very confident. Behind. That is what I hope everybody <laughs> has the opportunity to try to get there, because that's the goal. Um, and it was certainly a goal for us. Now the proof is in implementation. So I just want to share a little bit of the experience of having had to uh, do one of these things and what we felt the keys were, and it was transparency and it was stakeholder engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you to Francois, Vajika, Justine, our friends at the um, Center for Sport and Human Rights for this uh, delightful event. And uh, yes, just as a um, final words, if uh, human rights implications of mega sporting events are for all of us to uh, work on, unfortunately, sportive implications of mega sporting events are only for those uh, qualified as an Italian. Unfortunately, uh, I do not uh, imply in that in that last uh, segment, but we will we will surely see each other in 2026, Mary, in uh, the US, Canada and, and Mexico. Have a lovely evening, have a lovely day and um, see you all soon for another UN, um, another human rights conversation uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you.